Welcome to the Year City Podcast, where we get to know our neighbors so that we can be good neighbors. I'm your host, Aaron Williams, and before we get to our guest today, we're going to say a thank you to our sponsors. Our sponsor for today's episode is Carbert Services. Just a reminder to those in the Homewood community who haven't heard, Carbert Services offers a discount to Homewood residents on their heating and cooling needs and matches that discount with a donation to the Homewood Library and or the Homewood City Schools Foundation. Reach out if you're overdue for a seasonal service or find yourself with any repair needs. Call anytime at 205-999-8424 or check them out online at carbertservices.com. Again, that's 205-999-8424, Alabama license number 20103. Today, I'm joined by Judith Wright, who is soon to be the interim director of the Homewood Public Library, and Laura Tucker, who is the special projects librarian. We're going to talk about what services the library provides to the community, some of the inner workings of how it functions, and what inspired them to become librarians. Maybe we can even get some book recommendations. Judith and Laura, thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. I grew up going to the library and reading books and stuff like that. So I'm very excited about talking about (laughs) some of this stuff. First and foremost, let's talk about the community aspect of the library. How is the library involved in the Homewood community? I think it's this community is so wonderful because they love this library. They're always in here. And I just find that this community just... I mean, yeah, they just love us and we love them right back. So there's a great partnership with different businesses and different organizations, but there's just constantly people coming in here and discovering new aspects of the library. Mm -hmm. Like what? Um, I think the number one thing people come in here for, if you have a young child, we have wonderful programs for all ages, like story times all the way up to book clubs. And then we also offer programs like job searching, computer classes, things like that. So no matter what you need, we try to adapt and have it here for you. So you guys are actively listening to kind of like what people are requesting Always, because this is their library. So if we aren't providing something they need, then we're not doing our job. How do you find that stuff out? Just by talking to people? Is there like a formal process where people can suggest things? We have a large staff and they're always listening to the community. So sometimes just by having a conversation at the desk over there, you know, a patron might say, oh, we're really, you know, this is something we're focusing on in our household. And then from there, that just sparks an idea with the librarians and then we run with it. Okay. So it's like a little bit like a uh like an osmosis where you just, oh yeah, I overheard this thing and it gave me an idea. Yeah. Cool. Cool. What does an average week look like for a librarian? This is, I was very curious, like what is, what is your day-to-day responsibilities? What does that look like? It depends on which part of the library you're in. So when I was in the children's department at the front of the library on public service floor, It starts out pulling books for holds, pulling curbside appointments. Um, We're feeding pets in here. Okay. Um, Just getting everything ready for the day so that when patrons come in, we're ready to say, hey, how are you doing today? What can Mm -hmm. I help you with? And start those conversations at the desk. Mm -hmm. Um, We're also setting up lots of meeting rooms for programs and trying to get all that squared away. And then it just hit the ground running. I feel like ever since I started working here, the day goes by fast and I'll look up and I'll be like, Oh my goodness, it's almost time to leave. I've never that's felt a, that's like good, I, right? it is. It's a good feeling. Yeah. It is. Um it but it does look a little bit different when you're in the off the public service floor and in administration because mm-hmm. then you're problem solving, right, Judith? Yes. I mean, in the administration, the day can be involved with budgets or grant writing or board meetings or planning a block party, which is a huge deal or friends of the library book sale. So There's a lot that the public doesn't see, but then when you're out here, every day is different. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what makes it so fun. Like, I never know what I'm going to be doing. Like, if you had asked me two weeks ago if I'd be doing a podcast, I'd be like, no, (laughs) but here we are. So, and that's the fun part of it. Interesting. So there's, there's a big difference between the service side, like you were saying. Okay. So when you're doing these boardroom meetings and, and all that type of stuff, what are y'all talking about? Just how the library is 
um, providing services to the community. It's just kind of a, a constant way to make sure that we are actively trying to be the best library we can for our community. Mm-hmm. So, Who's all on this board? Is, yeah. Are, you- yeah, the board of trustees is our um, kind of our, the library's uh, operating manager, so to speak. There okay. are five board members, and they're each made up from a ward from the Homewood um, City, and they're nominated by the city council. Okay. I don't, don't know much about Homewood, but That's y'all okay. have wards. Yes, there are and, five. And uh, a city councilor. Y'all have two per ward, right? Yes. And one of them nominates a person mm-hmm. that lives in their ward yes. to do this? That's exactly how it is. And then so they operate on the Library Board of Trustees, and they approve our policies, and they really just, you know, make sure that we're still doing what we need to to the community. Mm-hmm. And we have a wonderful library board, and they're so supportive when we come up with um new ideas, and they're just really passionate about the library. Yeah. And I think that's a wonderful just a starting point for a library board member is to love your library. Yeah, yeah. What's the process for them to be nominated? If somebody out there was like, oh, I would love to be on the board of the library, how do do they do that? Yeah, there just has to be a vacancy first. So they serve out four-year terms, and when a vacancy comes up, the um, city council representative nominates someone, and there's an interview process. Mm -hmm. Who, Who has the final stamp of approval on that? City council. Okay. Okay. So a city councilor nominates and then they all vote mm-hmm. or something? Yeah. There's like just the interview process and then the selection. What's the value of getting one board member from every ward? I think it just makes sure that their community is represented. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they can just, yeah, it just makes sure that the whole community is, has a voice in the library, but they all have a voice anyway, because we listen to anyone that comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the wonderful thing. Everyone, this is their library. And I constantly remind myself like, hey, we're here to serve this community. And this is a community we love. And this is a community that loves the library. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys are always listening and trying to get ideas from the public and from people and, and kind of like using them as an origin source for where features and things like that should come from. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you face in, I guess there's two different sections, the administrative section, what are some of the biggest challenges? And then in the service section, what are some of the biggest challenges? I would say in the service section, um, it's, it's, you want to hopefully connect someone with that book that they want right then or that resource. Um, So just making sure that our staff is knowledgeable and knows where everything is, or if we can't find it, like here's what we can do for you to help Mm -hmm. you find that resource. Mm -hmm. Um, So that could, you know, every once in a while you get one of those questions where you're like, Ooh, I have not heard about fjords in a while and I forgot how to spell it and say it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm going to find you a book about fjords. And since we're part of the Jefferson County Library Cooperative, thank goodness, we have access to even more books than we could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. So we can always get a book from another section, uh, another library, I mean, and or even have it sent it through interlibrary loan from other libraries in the state of Alabama. So most of the time we are able to connect someone with that. But it can be a challenge. So if y'all don't have have something y'all can mm-hmm. borrow it from another library mm-hmm. do y'all have your own library card for that <laughs> well luckily it's one county one card so the, your library okay. card gets you access to all the 40 uh, different libraries in jefferson county and so that's a wonderful benefit the mm-hmm. fact that we just lend to each other is a huge thing how do you guys manage requests of that nature because i assume y'all get requests for hey you know library over here wants a book that y'all have, how do y'all manage coordinating all that? Oh, thankfully, our cataloging system that we use just sends us a list that we check constantly throughout the day because it's hundreds of books a day being requested. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, it's a lot of books. So y'all are probably spending a lot of time pulling that stuff yeah. off the shelf and finding all of those types just of things. Just one of the daily duties. What about the administrative side? Some, something that we are always doing in administration is looking ahead at the bigger picture. So something that might take several years to implement, that's kind of what we're always working on. Mm-hmm. One thing we're working on now, which I'm not letting a cat out of the bag because I don't think it's a secret, we're trying to bring passport services to this library. Okay. And that is not something that just happens overnight. So there's a lot of research and planning and funding involved in all of that. And that's what administration takes on. We look at the bigger picture stuff that takes longer to implement. Gotcha. What's your process for organizing the team members to do this research and to do these complicated 
research I think just task. having constant conversation and starting that dialogue, the best part of any business is just communication. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're always working towards to make sure we're all aware of what's going on and how everyone can help. And it's always important to have strong team members who bring a lot to the table because I might think, oh yeah, I, I got this. And then I'm like, oh, I definitely need some help. So that's where I like to pull people in and just brainstorm and talk things out. So finding some people that might be able to be like a good bounce, bouncing yes. board or just you know, building a strong team or something. Yeah. And we have a great team here. Gotcha. I, I do similar stuff. My wife is my dartboard where I throw a bunch of ideas and she tells me if I hit the mark or not. <laughs> so you guys have mentioned a couple of areas. Y'all have mentioned friends of the library, the library board. We've talked a little bit about all that. What are all the different organizations that kind of come together to form this library? What is Friends of the Library? Absolutely. So the Friends of the Library is an organization that's existed for a very long time, mm -hmm. and they um, help raise funds for the library to help with programs, like when we have program snacks or craft supplies, um, helping with our summer reading programs. And they operate a Friends bookstore in the library where they sell used books, mm -hmm. and um, which is... I. I during the pandemic, especially, we found out when people were cleaning out, boy, do people love having a friend's bookstore <laughs> where they can send um, their, their treasures to be mm -hmm. found by other people. And they are all volunteers. It's all volunteer run. And we have a great group right now that's working hard to make the bookstore, you know, have all kinds of things on the shelf. We have other organizations, too. So the, the Friends of the Library volunteers, they do bookstore. And we, a few years ago, created a foundation. So the Homewood Library Foundation is also an organization that's um, uh, devoted to the mission of the library and also raising funds. So they raise funds in a different way. And one of the big fundraisers that we do is the Blot Party that's mm -hmm. in August. So August 20th of 2022 is going to be the seventh annual. It would have been the ninth, but, you know, we had a little hiccup. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big fundraiser for them. And they help get sponsors, food sponsors and beverage sponsors and raise money from local businesses. And all of that goes to support the mission of the library mm -hmm. and create things like the little children's nook when we came in. Just other projects that yeah. we're working on throughout the year. So you've got friends of the library. They all volunteer based. They, they accept book donations from the library, from the public. Right. They do have our, our discarded books and they also from the public. Yeah. Okay. And then they sell those in the bookstore. I mean, it's, you know, 50 cents for children's books and um, it's really good deal. Yeah, it's yeah, got yeah. lots of magazines. And it's all donations so that, you know, as as low a price as it is, it's yeah. all profit. Yes, exactly. For the library exactly. and stuff like that. Okay, cool, cool. And then the foundation, they primarily organized the block party. What? Mm, that's their biggest, most visible happens? fundraiser. <laughs> What happens at a block party? Well, um, we go outside um, of the library mm -hmm. and uh, into unfamiliar waters. Tons, of, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's in the parking lot, um, and they've got tons of food vendors. Um, I remember one year. I think I got so full after eating after all the food vendors who donate food. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's people um, from the community. So you've got like Little Donkey, you've got Urban Cookhouse, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of businesses donate delicious food. Mm -hmm. um, and people buy tickets. They're pretty reasonable. You know, it's like $25 um, for 21 and up and then $10 for everyone else um, because they cut like local breweries, donate beer and uh, wine and other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just a fun community event. And we've got a lot of people who are excited that it's back. So when you're doing this, the $25 gets you in and mm -hmm. you can eat whatever you want, or do you still have <laughs> yeah. to pay for no, food? No, no, yeah, absolutely. It gets, yeah, all the food, all mm -hmm. the drinks. Yeah, yeah. And these local businesses are donating their, their time and their food and all of their resources to help raise money for the library. Exactly. Cool. Yes, it is. How can, if there's like a local business owner out there mm -hmm. that wants to get involved in this, yeah. how can they get involved? That'd be wonderful. They can contact me here at the library and mm -hmm. ask for Laura Tucker. We also have the foundation board is made up of 17 members who are also volunteers. Um, so they're going out in the community right now and they're asking local businesses. They're you know, hunting them they down. <laughs> 
in the nicest way possible with sweet letters. <laughs> yeah. We do have um, some sponsorships coming in right now, and it's exciting to see because I'm new in this position. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked the block party before, but this is going to be my first year helping organize everything. Is that Are those two sources of income the primary or the only sources of income for the library? How does the library maintain its funding? Well, we get funding from the city, and the city of Homewood's always been so generous and supportive of the library. So the Friends and the Foundation just act in other ways to support the library, and their funding provides, you know, like we can do a little bit more like with programs or just kind of extra things. Mm -hmm. So we're very um, appreciative of all the funding that we've received, and everyone has been so kind to us over the years with it. Okay. Yeah, the city's been amazing. They brought all of our staff back um, and really support the staff here at the library and the huge collection of books that you can see and also the huge collection of books you can't see that mm -hmm. are all digital resources. Yeah, yeah. All of that is thanks to the city. And so. our new computer lab, which we greatly appreciate. Um, before the pandemic, the computer lab was on the lower level. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that time... Down in the dungeon. Yes. <laughs> There's just ghosts there. It's, it's, it's fine. We are haunted, yes. Friendly ghosts. Yes. Oh, totally they're, they're very nice. Um, but yeah, so during that time, we were able to expand off of Ridge Road, and that computer lab is wonderful. It has, I think, 24 computers mm -hmm. um, and several new, brand new study rooms, and it's allowed us to do so much more for our community. Mm -hmm. When you have these computer labs... What types of things are you doing with that that uh, is beneficial? Is this like adult programs or is this like well, stuff for kids? I always try to remember that 25% of the United States doesn't have internet access at home. Mm -hmm. So the main function of the computer lab is to provide internet access. Now, whether that's someone just quickly running in to print off a label for their Etsy store or someone who really needs to find some research articles for a paper they're working on so but then we have computer lab classes um, and they're rotating I think we do Word and PowerPoint Excel and we have a wonderful instructor David and he is much more knowledgeable than any of those things than I am <laughs> but I think the study labs are a wonderful resource because a lot of times people come in and they need a dedicated space to operate a, a meeting room tutoring or I've seen a lot of people do zoom interviews where they're applying for a job and they need a quiet space yeah. so they come to the library and they check out a study room for a couple hours and they can do their interview and that's wonderful to see someone who is working working towards getting a job and how we're able to help, even if it's just a, a way to give them a small space or to give them access to a computer to do their interview. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just sort of like, hey, we're providing these tools and these resources and, and the community can leverage them in, in the ways that are beneficial to them. Okay. And you just need a library card to come and do those things? Well, for the meeting rooms, you really don't even need like a library card. You just need to come on in. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Yeah, the study rooms, uh, I think all you need is a valid driver's license mm -hmm. to do one of those. And um, for the computer lab, for those that don't have a library card, we have passes that they can use. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have meeting rooms available that people can rent for meetings. Um, and they're very reasonably, reasonably priced. And I love that we have that space because when you mentioned space, I was like, that's one thing that we have is – literally tons of rooms where people can rent and have, mm -hmm. you know, their Magic the Gathering Club, or um, there's also a Magic Club that meets here, yes. I think, a Magician Club, um, oh, okay. you know, Doctor okay. Who fan club, whatever it is, you know, the yeah. library is a great space for if, people to come. If you're starting together. a fan club, come on down to yeah. the library. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, you said that communication is a huge part of the success here of the team at the library. What's your approach to administering successful communication. What, what does that mean? To me, it just means making sure everyone is informed. I mean, that's just the base part is like, hey, just sharing ideas. Um, that's always something I just want, I'm trying to work at and, and making sure it's an ongoing goal here is that we're just constantly communicating, whether it's brainstorming, bouncing ideas as a dartboard or a sounding board or just trying to figure out what will work here. You know, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about programs and listening to the community and sometimes we'll try something and it doesn't work. And it might be that I have to go ask her like, Hey, what can I do differently? Like, what am I missing to make this 
better or maybe we should pivot into a different direction. How do you measure that it didn't work? How do you determine success versus a failed idea? Yeah, it's not always about numbers. And that's an important thing to remember. You might have an event here at the library that has 300 come in and you might have an event that just has three, Mm -hmm. but they both can be successful. You just have to listen to the people coming in and seeing what they're getting out of it. Okay. Is there any type of like you said, listening to the people and so the people kind of determine whether or not hey, I got something valuable and I took that away, even if it was only two or three people, that's, hey, we did it. We Good job, everybody. We, we still, we've made a difference to some people. Yeah, that's huh? that's really, it's not always about the numbers. And we, we have wonderful numbers. Mm-hmm. Like our circulation for books is, I mean, through the roof. And we are one of the busiest libraries in the state for our size with regard to number of events and attendance. But sometimes it's just about what, the patron gets out of that event Mm. and we could have a really small event and it might just have two people, but those two people just were so thankful and appreciative that they were able to find that here. Um, One of my favorite programs, and it's not a favorite, it's just a unique service that we offer is we partner with the Greater Birmingham Humane Society Mm -hmm. to offer Dixie's Pet Loft Support Group. And it's just a support group for people who are grieving their little fur babies like their pets and that's not something you see and you don't think about needing it until you do need it yeah yeah yeah. um and so that's always something that i'm so proud that we are able to offer and partner with the humane society for yeah yeah i can tell you that my wife would need that (laughs) so uh you mentioned that you guys are part of a bigger system for jefferson county And how does Jefferson County influence Homewood? It's huge. I mean, they are our central uh, cataloging system and uh, the way that we share books, all of that works through Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. I think I just heard the courier come in with all of the books coming from other libraries that they're going to check in and put on the shelf today. So it helps us all run really smoothly. And one thing that's been great, our um, former director, Deborah Fout, was – the head of the directors for a while or in, in charge of that group. And they met here, which was nice because we're kind of central to the county. Um, so everyone comes together here and so many people see what Homewood has to offer to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we try to be really supportive of each other. We love sharing ideas. We have a Jefferson County um, Public Library Association. Mm-hmm. So staff members from other libraries meet regularly. Um, there's an adult services meeting, a reader's advisory, a children's meeting coming up, circulation. So they regularly meet together and share ideas. So it's huge but for us. the policy conversations happen at Homewood. Jefferson is just kind of providing, hey, we have we have tools and resources if you if you need it. But policy decisions and kind of the direction of Homewood is discussed here? Well, specifically for the Homewood Public Library, yes. But then there are also policies um, for the county that we adhere to with regard to like how we set everything up with patrons' accounts because we all use the same um, cataloging system, which is so helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is just a wonderful thing. Is it just like a software that y'all use? Yes. But we're all connected, so I can see what's on the shelf at the Five Points West Library, Mm -hmm. and I can call Five Points West. I'm like, hey, this patron's heading right over there. Can you check to make sure that this book's on the shelf for them when they get there, or would you mind sending it over? Mm -hmm. Um, So we do have um, policies that we just kind of operate together as a county, but then Homewood has specific policies too. So the county library system... How do the individual libraries influence those types of county level policies or is, are those just decided somewhere else? No, we, um, the board of directors, so each director at each library will meet and they'll discuss, you know, kind of what's coming up and they'll talk about policies. And then there's an executive committee that also discusses policies mm-hmm. for just the county libraries. But uh, Homewood is a municipality, so we operate on our own with regard to just this library. Okay. And you're about to be soon the interim director. Yes. Okay. What does the process for choosing, because that's like a temporary position. Mm-hmm. So you're assistant director now moving up. 
what does the process look like for finding a new director for the library? So that is one of the responsibilities that falls to our board of trustees. Mm -hmm. They're in charge and it's their responsibility to hire a director. So our um, our former director is Deborah Fouch. She retired after 37 years on May 1st. Thank you for your service, yes. Deborah. That's, she knows that's everything <laughs> about this library. And so, but, you know, she was... She's very excited about her retirement. She got a retirement dog. And <laughs> so she's looking forward to that. And so from there, we'll do a search. Um, sometimes um, director searches can be national. And the board of trustees will interview and select the new director. Okay. So you're not necessarily looking for someone local. It just depends. Anyone is welcome to apply. But sometimes, you know, someone might look at Homewood and think that's a great place. So they're mm -hmm. welcome to apply if they, you know, live in another state or something like that. So somebody applies and they're coming in, they're interviewing. What are some qualities that y'all are looking for in a director to make sure that they, they're a good fit and that they're a good leader? I guess that's up to the board to see what they're looking for. But for me, I always want to make sure someone is just a team player here. Mm -hmm. um, and being director, you have to not only be responsible for this library and our 51 or two employees, but you also have to be fiscally responsible to the city of Homewood. So you're given a budget and you're given responsibilities and you have to adhere to that. Like you have to be responsible and just you have to oversee the library and make sure it's meeting our goals. We do have a long range plan. It's a five year plan that we do. Um, with our staff and our community every five years. It's on file with the state. And it gives us a set of goals that we've set that we want to achieve within five years. So sometimes that means um, focusing more on different aspects of programming that we haven't covered, maybe making sure that we're constantly striving to reach new communities within um, the city of Homewood or outside, whether it is building a certain collection or increasing our funding or, you know, just it gives us goals to work for. And that's a wonderful thing to have. It keeps us constantly reminding that, hey, this is something to strive towards. And that's part of the mm -hmm. director. Their director is our leader and they set the tone for, you know, how we operate. Okay. Okay. Very cool. When they're setting this tone, they're taking all that input from the people who are working here, who are collecting that input from the community that is shopping? <laughs> what do y'all call it? Well, uh, Borrowing? we call them patrons. Okay. They're patronizing, okay. but like in the good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess utilizing the library. Utilizing. Okay. Good word. <laughs> so y'all are just collecting all of that and it's just sort of moving up the chain in, in that type of area. Yeah. I think it's it's always important, and this is one of my favorite things about Homewood. I've worked at a couple of other libraries. Homewood is a yes library, and I've always said that because if someone comes in, even if it's like a five-year-old kid and they were like, I really love Pokemon, I want, I need more Pokemon at this library, and it's not like, well, no, but it's like, yes, you need Pokemon, and we will help you with that, whether it is finding it on our shelves, borrowing it from another library, or developing a Pokemon scavenger hunt next week. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one thing I love is that if our community tells us something, we're here to listen. And this goes back into earlier where it's like you're organizing these events, and even if it reaches just a couple of kids who are super excited about Pokemon, which is you know, probably most kids are excited about Pokemon, but that is a success. That's how you measure that is like, hey, we 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 did what that kid was looking for. Yeah. Well, there's actually a Pokemon scavenger hunt right now in the teen department. And that's because last week a team was like, hey, we need a Pokemon scavenger hunt. We just need and, it. And then there, that's how it happened. <laughs> sometimes it's that simple. Like, you know, it's not like planning out sometimes. Yes, we do plan. We love to plan and be organized, mm -hmm. but sometimes it is it develops overnight an idea. You know, I think that that's an interesting aspect of the library because most places, they can only do these types of things if they generate an income, if they, hey, like you said earlier, it doesn't really matter about numbers. That's not true at most places where, hey, we, we need a certain number for this to be considered a success. But here at the library, because y'all have city funding and because y'all are serving the community with that funding, y'all y'all don't really need to make sure that it's every event is returning a profit and every event is a you know huge financial success. Y'all can actually focus on these 
little things that are touching the community in, in different ways that maybe a bigger company might not have the, you know, ability to do because they, they need to have a positive impact on their financial budget at the end of the day. And that's the most important thing about libraries is we are free. Um, you can come in to a computer class and it is completely free. You can come into um, a story time and it's free. That's what we're here for. And we're here for everyone. Hmm. And part of this free stuff that you have going on is your NASA program. Oh, yeah. So what is going on with this? <laughs> so in 2017, we were the only library in the state of Alabama to be awarded the NASA at My Library grant. Mm -hmm. And it, I was the project manager and I was just like, oh, my gosh, we got this grant. And I didn't see that coming. Um, but it's been so wonderful. And so we were one of 75 libraries that were awarded the grant. And it allowed us to work with NASA to promote um, STEAM and STEM within our community. And our community loves science. They they really do. Mm. So it allowed us to, I mean, I'm trying to, we, we did so many different programming okay. on different aspects of science. And, but the cool part is it allowed us to borrow lunar and meteorite samples from NASA. That's cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, and so we haven't been able to do it because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping next year we'll be able to borrow them back. They come from the Johnson Space Center in Texas. We get them for several weeks. They are under lock and key. Um, and anytime that they come out, they have to be with me, which is so terrifying that I am responsible for these. But then they also have to be with an armed guard if they're any type of being um, on display with the public. Wow. Because people have tried to steal them before. Not with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> But they are priceless because we're not just hopping over to the moon to get, you know, yeah. more samples. So that's a wonderful partnership with NASA. And also it allowed us to develop a telescope lending program. We were the first library in the state to loan telescopes. I thought that I, when I read that, I thought that was like a figurative thing. Like, oh, telescope lending. That must be some type of, you know, special form yeah, of I'm hand special you a, form of lending. Uh -uh, 11 pound telescope you can take home. I did not. <laughs> <It's a long laughs> but that's just cool. We're not just books. And that's the thing, you know, as the society and community evolves, we're right there with it. So yeah. sometimes that means changing up what you can come check out um, or the services you provide here at the library. So that's why I talked about, you know, one thing we're looking at is passports because, People need to get their passports. And so if they're already in the library, maybe get your passport at your library. Yeah, yeah. So. Make it make it easy. Meet people where they're at kind exactly. of thing. Exactly, yeah. So with this uh, lunar and meteorite sample, y'all haven't done that yet? Y no, we've done it a couple of times. Oh, okay. And it's really fun. Um, the last time we had them... Uh, I want to say it was January 2020. And so Laura and I took them to all the elementary schools mm -hmm. and we did story time in the libraries with them. And we just got to show the kids these samples. I've also, when they're here, we'll sometimes, we have a local astronomer, mm -hmm. Dr. DeLucas, who will, no, not an astronomer, astronaut. Uh, astronaut. Oh. Yes, astronaut. He's and been out there? He's been yes. out there. And he'll come and talk about his journey into space, the training he did, and then we'll highlight the samples as well. Wow. Yeah. That's super cool to have a local figure and you can provide these samples and everything so that kids can see them. You know, when I went up to Chicago and I went to the Field Museum and you go to the meteorite section, it's sometimes they just look like a rock and you're like, yeah, whatever. But sometimes it's like, I've never seen anything look like that. You know, it'll it'll be... It, they just can look very strange. And it's so cool to see something that's like like the lunar sample. Somebody went to the moon and got this and then brought it back. And like, I don't know. That, you said we can't just hop on over and do that yet. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, I, we're I getting there. I always ask the kids when we when the kids see them. I was like, "How much do you think these cost? How much do you think they're worth?" And they'll you know shoot out crazy numbers. And I'm like, "They're worth zero dollars." And they're like, "No." <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And uh, so when I ship them back to NASA, like they, you know, what's the worth of this item? And we put zero because this is how NASA explained to me. And it's how I explained to anyone who asked. People gave their lives to get these samples and you can't put a price on a life. Hmm. Therefore, these items are priceless. Um, 
Now, why we ship them back in the U.S. Postal Service makes me super nervous, but that's the way they go. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a lot about the library, the services that it provides, how it connects to the community. Let's kind of focus on y'all for a moment. <laughs> what inspired y'all to, y'all went to study library at, both of y'all went to University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so y'all y'all wanted to do this. Y'all wanted to end up in a library somewhere. Why? Uh, my mom was a librarian um, growing up. So okay. we spent a lot of time at Springville Road Library. So this is just a family I trade. I mean, it is, but I didn't think I would do that. I went to study history and English. No clue what I wanted to do. And then I got a job shelving in a children's department. And I just thought it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And Ever since, and then I got a full time job here working in a children's department, and I was doing story time, and I was like, "This is, this is so fun." Um, so I kept working <laughs> in the library, um, and I was like, "Well, I'm going to go and get my degree now." Mm -hmm. um, so I did, which I'm glad I did because I learned a lot through that program at SLIS, um, or the School of Library and Information Sciences. Might have a different name now. It has been a minute since I've graduated, mm -hmm. 2009. Um, but yeah, I did go through that program and learned a lot, which helped me as head of children's services, because when you're selecting books, um, especially in ordering collections, um, it's, it's great to have that degree under your belt to know exactly what you're doing. Okay. Okay. And. Oh, my mom told me to go to library school. Um, <laughs> was she a librarian as well? No. <laughs> um, no, I had gotten my bachelor's in art history and history from UAB, and I wasn't exactly sure what to do next. I knew I needed to go get a master's. And mom was like, you, you worked in a library at your elementary school and your middle school. You should just go to library school. And I was like, okay. And so I just started looking. I was like, what, you know, what does it mean to go to library school to get your master's in library and information studies? And it really just, I fell into this community that I loved working in a library because um, I used the libraries growing up. My mom would drop me off when I was a kid and then I would use the payphone to, you know, six hours later, tell her to come get me, mm -hmm. um, which don't do that now. But, um, <laughs> but that, yeah, I was just always in libraries and I never thought of it as a career. I just loved them mm -hmm. from the patron side. And so coming at it from a career side, I fell in love with it either more, even more because I didn't quite understand at the time what libraries did and what they offered. I mean, we're completely free. You don't really see that anywhere else um, nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so I went to library school and actually Homewood was my very first job, like in this department part time a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then you went to another one and came back? Um, I've worked four different positions in this library, and I've worked at two other libraries as well. And I just kept coming back to Homewood. Mm -hmm. So I've worked in children's, circulation, adult services as the teen librarian, and then now in administration. So okay. it's a wonderful place to work. We are a team and we are a family. Laura, you said you're studying library and you learn so much. I did not know this when I started planning for this episode, but there are library degrees and there's like there's a there's an entire course of study around this. What are you studying when you're studying library? What are the skills that you're developing? Um, a lot of the skill I mean you're developing research, the ability yeah. to research and mm -hmm. help people research or also like how to connect people to resources, whether that's digitally or in mm -hmm. person. Um, but you're studying in, in some classes that I took, I took teen and children's classes. So I was reading books that I never read before and audio books and mm -hmm. learning different formats and learning how to do programs for kids and teens. Um, so I loved learning the literature. Mm -hmm. That was, that was so much fun <laughs> um, so to be able to like, go to school for that. So it's like, Learning how to organize, mm -hmm. learning, learning sort of the, the process of, like you said, mm -hmm. research and just gaining exposure to the different types of formats of resources, right. that type of thing. Right. You're also learning things like how to build a website because um, especially a lot of smaller libraries – that librarian might do everything that you see, the website, mm. to building the collection, um, to doing the programs. I mean, there's a lot of librarians out there that are doing it all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wear all the hats at all oh, times. Oh, okay. Um, so you just never know. I mean. It's like r learning how to run a small business. It, oh, gosh. That's yeah, a good that's exactly it. what yeah. to look at. Like some of my <laughs> library school classes were 
administration side, like how to manage a budget, Mm -hmm. um, how grant writing, that's a huge thing that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, Operating with a board of trustees and making sure you're reaching your community. Um, Yesterday, a patron stopped me and they said, hey, I'm looking for this book and I couldn't find it on Google. And so like, they were like, help me. And I'm like, yeah. And so that's part of our job. Like, yeah, a lot of people know how to Google. Some people don't. And But what we can do is take it one step further to the resources we have. Like I was able to find that book in just a few minutes and borrow it from a library in Montgomery. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to send it over through an out-of-county request. So, yeah, we operate within the county, but we also work outside of the county. And those are things that library school teaches you is just to find those resources and know how to help people when they don't know exactly what they're looking for. You know, I was talking to a friend recently and we were talking about asking the right questions. And that is a skill that you kind of don't realize that uh, is so important and so valuable. Knowing how to formulate a correct question so that you can do that research like you're talking about and you can find the answer that you're looking for. You start with nothing and then you, you identify hey, these are the directions that I need to go in. What questions can get me there as fast as possible? That is an important skill that you're right. Not everyone sort of, you know, has, I guess, a, a, an equal grasp on. A lot of times when people come in here needing our help, they don't know exactly what they're looking for. Mm. Um, and sometimes someone will ask me, like, I'm looking for a crossword puzzle from, you know, 15 months ago that I just randomly saw or you just, just want to finish it. it exactly and that's the thing and so people are you know they're trained to think of librarians as keepers of gatekeepers of knowledge and we kind of are mm-hmm. so i might not do a crossword puzzle in my own time but i can help you find that one from 15 months ago yeah it might take me a minute but <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's just being able to find what you're looking for and stuff like that it's an unappreciated skill and you know when you're in that position where it's like, I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas, but you couldn't find, it's like being on a tree and you don't have any branches within reach or something like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyways, that idea of like, I don't even, I don't even know where to turn and having someone that can help you, Hey, let's get you to the first step. All right, here's the path go, right? Like that can be really, really useful. And that's a daily practice here, the reference interview. So, yeah, exactly. Oh, you never know what kind of questions you're going to get when you work with the public. (laughs) There's always a surprise. Yes. Laura, you used to be head of children. Yeah. All right. So what, what does that look like? What is your approach to connecting with kids and, you know, getting them interested in learning and all of those other things that we associate with libraries. Well, they're some of my favorite conversation partners in the library. And uh, the the reference interview with a kid is my favorite. Um, Oh, hi, you know, how are you? Good. And what are you looking for? Dinosaurs. Great. Let's go get you some dinosaur books. You know, it's, it's just it's so much fun. Um, mm-hmm. So talking to the kids, finding out what they need. And uh, I love kids because they're earnest and they love what they love mm-hmm. and they love to tell you about it. Um, I know some, not everyone does. Some people are shy, but then when there's a shy patron and you figure out what books they love and you say, I know you just wore the, or read the war that saved my life. So I've got these other historical fiction books for you. I hope you like them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you don't have to tell me, you know, or, you know, you don't have to explain to me if you liked them, but I hope you like these, you know? Um, so just kind of knowing, getting to know the patrons that come in here, because mm-hmm. we are a mid-sized library. So you do get to know people's names, um, maybe not their parents' names. Cause it would be like John's mom and, <laughs> um, <laughs> Emery's dad, hey, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed working with the the kids and the patrons in here. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have, as you can see around us, a lot of fun resources and yeah. books and things for them to check out. So. Well, you know, when you're a kid, just from what I remember, <laughs> you're very curious yeah. about like everything. I I wanted to read, you know, I used to read my science books in class, like just because it, this is so fascinating. I might be an exception, but uh, just fostering that curiosity and just, you know, helping kids find something like, like you said, they're very enthusiastic and passionate about 
these these subjects and stuff like that. And yes. I, I think that's interesting that uh, that really called to you and you're like, yes, this is some of my favorite things to interact with and, and help guide. It, it is. And I, I love because um, I thought about education for a minute and then boy teachers, they're amazing. I mm-hmm. want to say that right now. <laughs> but I love the idea of that connecting to information and then they get to decide, you know, what what sparks their interest and then being able to go off that a little further and connect them, you know, with all the dinosaur books in the County, if they haven't read (laughs) the ones on our shelf yet. Um, I think that is my favorite thing about working in a library is building those connections and relationships. So I was the teen librarian for a long time and I just would love like a teen would show up and like Miss Judith, I got my driver's license and I was their first stop after the DMV. Yeah. Um, And like that, that doesn't happen in all types of vocations. So it's just wonderful to know your community and see, you see some of these kids grow up and like some of my teens now work here, um, which is just wonderful because they came here as kids and teens and now as adults, they're, they're part of our mm-hmm. staff here, and that's wonderful. That's got to be really special, you know, probably not just for librarians, but also for teachers and stuff where it's like you taught a kid through through them growing up, and then when they become adults, you can – it's like, you know, oh, my gosh, I, I'm a little bit responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now when they come in – with their own kids and I'm just like oh I got old when did that happen yeah I'm getting to that point now where I was like maybe you know it is time to move on from children's now that children who came to my story time are graduating high school oh. <laughs> it's a you know it's a different feeling yeah, yeah. good feeling well hey if you're good at something right <laughs> exactly I, I did want to throw one more thing out before mm-hmm. I forget to say it about even going into the library yes my mom was a librarian my sister is a librarian too at O'Neill um but Uh, Working in a library, I loved the patrons, but it was the staff that was around me who I had so much fun with, and Mm -hmm. they had the same passion for the service, and there was nothing like it. And I was like, how do I get more of that? Mm -hmm. Um, So that was another big thing that kept me, like, I'm going to go to library school, I'm going to keep working in libraries, and coming to Homewood and working with Judith, and the staff here has been wonderful. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention yeah. how wonderful library staff members are. <laughs> Do most of them go to library school? Not everybody, and that's okay. A lot of people have learned a lot working um, mm-hmm. in the job. It's mainly the heads of department jobs that require library degrees, um, and usually those, you know, there's a librarian in a department. I always say there's certain things that you just don't learn in library school. Uh, remember the time we replaced the motor on the popcorn machine? We sure did. We, yeah. That's not a thing we learned in library school. <laughs> or fishing fish out of um, fish tanks. Yes. After mishaps. A necessary skill. Yes. You just, you don't do that on the job. I did not clean up chinchilla poop. Um, we do have pets here. And so that's always <laughs> in, a wonderful in library thing. school, but it, yeah. it's a daily thing. You You'll know? have two chinchillas. <laughs> Any other pets? We um we had a tarantula, Samantha, for twenty seven years. Yeah, she was she right. passed away. Aww, um, that's about an eight. old spider. Mm-hmm. I did not know that a spider could last. She is a kid that many years. Yeah, she was awesome. So we're looking at maybe in the fall adding another yeah. tarantula and then maybe another library pet. And that's a great service that we offer. That it's not really a service, but think about people that can't have pets at home Mm -hmm. just due to space or allergies. They can come here and they can see Thor and Loki, our chinchillas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I know that my wife was really appreciative. She loves chinchillas. (laughs) Yay! So we're talking about learning library and how it's similar to like learning how to run a small business and stuff like that. And one of the things that was really interesting to me. I was like, I didn't know that there was library school because you don't have like, you know, grocery store manager school Mm -hmm. or these other types of jobs that are very ubiquitous. You can find them in just about any city that you're going to. But I mean, maybe there is and I just don't know about it. (laughs) It's it's interesting that there is such a a dedicated study for that. I think the one at Alabama is the only one in the state, right? There are other schools, but I think it's the one accredited by oh, okay. the Alabama Library Association. Yeah, because it's yeah. Not, those school, those skills can be useful outside of a library, even mm-hmm, definitely. So. And uh, a lot of people come to librarianship from other um, 
other disciplines like you know education especially mm-hmm. um all social around work. social work yeah so it's a nice amalgamation of different people mm-hmm. um, that are drawn to librarianship even as a second career um but one thing i like the business analogy and i think one thing too that you learn in library school is how instead of building capital for your business you're learning how to build community equity mm-hmm. so you're you're working with the community listening um, and responding and being responsive. Building to trust. Needs and building trust. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's really what you're learning how yeah, to do yeah, because yeah. when you have trust and trust with your city, then, you know, you're, you're funding. And if your funding is used well and then your community is using your building and going to your programs, it's it's a, a beautiful example of, yeah. Yeah. Trust. One of the, the things that I've kind of realized getting older is that trust is a necessary ingredient to having a successful relationship. It's it's super difficult to have a relationship with somebody if you don't trust them because you're constantly, the entire time you're spending time with them, you're second guessing what's going on, you know, and it's just such a challenge if you don't have trust with people. Well, let us wrap it up with a couple of questions. One is library specific. What are some of your favorite books that you recommend people check out for adults, for kids? What do y'all recommend? For adults with kids, I would recommend our board book section um, because we have some really fun books by Jennifer Adams um, that are, uh, it's like Anna Karenina board book. I know it sounds like it wouldn't work, but it works. That sounds like a Um, long book. (laughs) It's really short. I think it's like an ABC primer, like these different primers that Mm -hmm. I think adults could enjoy reading with their young kids because they're like, oh, I know this story. and I learned how to cook by reading kids' cookbooks. So for anyone starting out, learn how to um, boil an egg. I highly recommend that. Um, my daughter is 10 and just started reading Jason Reynolds' books. Uh, yay. So, I mean, kids, adults, <laughs> or not kids, you know, middle school. <laughs> Read Jason Reynolds. <laughs> Jason Reynolds. <laughs> what is a, a primer? A primer um, would be like learning your colors, learning okay. your ABCs, um, numbers. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of so things. like, hey, you're just getting started in this category. That's right. Okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of young ones need need those primers. Yeah, and yeah It's yeah. fun when the adult can enjoy them too. <laughs> mm-hmm. What are some of Jason Reynolds? Uh, Ooh, everything. Ghost. Ghost, yes, Ghost. that's what she just started with. Ghost okay. is the best one. It's like the Patrick Swayze movie? <laughs> no, no. Um, There's no pottery. <laughs> Ghost is a track book. So it's the first in a series of four, and they all center around a track team. Okay. Um, and so Ghost is the first book about Ghost, and he's ridiculously fast. He is not on the track team. So it's not a real ghost. No, yeah, he's a person. He got his name because of how fast he runs. Oh, he, like he's running away from a ghost? Yes. Oh, okay. You don't have to read the book. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, recommending books is so hard for me. Um, yeah. It's not like somebody comes up and like, oh, tell me your favorite book. And I'm like, like, you mean today? Or do you mean like depending on this mood? So when a, m- most of my like interaction with book recommendations comes with teens and mm-hmm. I always ask what they don't like. Um, because that will help me more than anything. Okay. Um, and I love the they challenge. They don't know what they like yet. Exactly. But they can tell figure. you real fast. I love teens. They're weird and vulnerable and blunt. And so they might not know what they like, but they really know what they don't like. Yeah. And I love when they're like, well, I don't read. I'm like, you just haven't found the right book yet. And that's what we're going to do today. And mm-hmm. sometimes that book might be a graphic novel. It might be like an audio book that they listen to on their phone with Hoopla or Libby. Um, but my favorite absolute book is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo, which is a teen book written in verse. And mm-hmm. if I could get everyone to read that, I would. But sometimes the book you read is not f- the right book at that, for you at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's always a thing to remember. Like, I love this book, but that's because I was at a certain point in my life and a time where it, it really reached me. Mm-hmm. So I have like a kind of a stash of books that I try to recommend based on what someone tells me. I grew up reading and I love engaging with books. There's, you know, I used to love fiction and that was where I spent a lot of my time is just reading fiction and and I would just go crazy on a book. And when I started reading some nonfiction stories, I found out how transformative books can really be. It's like, you know, you read the fiction, you get the You get the stories of the heroes and you get those morals and you get those challenges that they solved. And, you know, there's a lot of 
wonderful attributes that you can get from heroes in, in stories, right? But uh, I read a nonfiction book and it just, it completely changed my approach to like how I deal with my everyday life and things like that. So books can be really transformative uh, pieces of, of knowledge. What was that book you read that changed your life? Oh you can't gosh. just not tell us. <laughs> it was like what we do. It was how to win friends and, and influence, influence people. people. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was transformative. It taught me, it was how to have a relationship, right? Like that's what the book is really about. It's not like, Oh, how to, how to win friends. And it, it makes it sound like a competition, but really what the book is, is talking about is how do you form a connection? How do you form a relationship with people? And, you know, when I was younger, that was actually something I struggled with. <laughs> I love that. Actually, what I'm reading right now, How to Be Perfect by Mike Schur. And uh, if anyone has watched The Good Place or knows mm -hmm. Mike Schur, he's into philosophy. So it's a book that I can read about philosophy because, it's you know, it's funny um, and it breaks it down. And uh, yeah, I'm really loving that. And celebrity memoirs. I'm not going to lie. I love listening to them on Libby. Okay. So... You know, no shade there. Any favorite celebrity memoirs? I mean, I'm listening to the new Gabriel Union. It's very good. Mm -hmm. um, I just listened to Cal Penn's memoir. I can't remember titles. I remember people. I can't yeah. remember anything unless I look at my Instagram. Like, that's where all my books are stored. And I'm just like, oh, what have I read? I mean, Tina Fey's Bossy Pants is always a good one. Um, I read Amy Poehler's. Born a Crime by Trevor oh, Noah. That's yes. a fantastic one, especially mm -hmm. the audio. Okay. Awesome. Well, Perfect. We got so many book recommendations just now. That's great. The theme for this season of Your City Podcast is how to be a good neighbor. All right. So if both of y'all could just tell me, what does being a good neighbor mean to you? This is how I would describe even like what I would look for in a boss, in a coworker, in a library is being um, accessible mm -hmm. and being um, open and engaged. That's, that's all, you know, I think if we can be that for our patrons, that's huge. If we can be that for our staff, um, that then we're doing our job right. Yeah. What does, what is it in your opinion, being engaged? What does that look like on a, you know, cause being neighborly is about forming connections with right. people. Right. What does that look like on like a person to person basis? Uh, well, hopefully doing, if you're doing a reference interview and trying to figure out what someone wants that you, you find out, you know, by asking the right questions mm -hmm. and find out what they need. But I also think it's uh, just checking back in with someone, like maybe someone went to go find the book and you see them at, oh, did you find what you need? Um, or if they sent you an email, emailing them back, calling them back. Um, I think that, you know, shows that mm -hmm. we're engaged, just checking back in. Being attentive. Us. Being attentive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I got you. Judith? Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> the exact same thing. Well, I, I mean, what she said, being open, being accessible, mm -hmm. but then listening too. Like I said earlier, people don't always know what they're looking for, whether it's a book or a service. And my mother was a guidance counselor and she, people would always talk to her randomly in the store forever. And I'm like, come on, mom, we got to go. And she's like, people just want someone to talk to and, and make sure they're heard and that someone's listening to them. So that's always a thing I keep with me is just to make sure the person who's in front of me knows that I'm there for them. I'm listening to them and I'm here to help them. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. Now, the final question is for the city of Homewood. What do you, what do you think? The city of Homewood should focus on next. Um, oh, you said the moon go into the moon. <laughs> All right, boom. yeah, Going we can make that. The, we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think part of what the city of Homewood is working on right now is um, what the library is working on too, which is helping those who are less proficient in English um, gain more proficiency. And the library is a great place for that. Mm -hmm. I know they've got great teachers in the schools and English learner teachers. So I think whatever we can do to help people you know, um, learn language. Um, we would love to be a part of that. Yeah. 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 So just helping people sort of learn to speak different languages or just English or. Well, I mean, well, we've got that too. We've got world language books as well, which is great. Um, but yeah, if anyone's trying to learn English to hopefully facilitate making that easier and not daunting, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, being a friendly place to do that. Was there anything that y'all wanted to close out with? No, just thank you for spotlighting the library. Um, a lot of times people not overlook libraries, but they don't think about libraries. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a lifelong library user and you grew up with libraries and you're still using them as adult, libraries can be 
in your life every day. But one thing we're always trying to do is find the people that haven't come into the library in a minute. Mm -hmm. So because we want to tell them how great we are. Find those yeah. strangers yeah. in the community and, you know, make them friends. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to say you, you could Google it and that's fine, but it's so much more fun when we Google it together. Yes. <laughs> we Google it correctly. <laughs> gotcha. We're here to help you Google. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Your City podcast. And I hope you enjoyed our talk today with Judith and Laura. If you enjoyed the show, you can help us out by sharing it with someone else that you think might enjoy it. That helps grow the show. It helps us reach out more people. It could be a friend, a family member, a coworker, just anyone that you think would enjoy this type of content. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Thank you again for listening, and we will catch you on the next one.